we're now ready to talk about baseline testing, monitoring, and optimal dosing of lithium. So here are some recommended baseline testing that you should do. I took these from the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines in Psychiatry, 14th edition, by Wiley Blackwell. So the baseline testing includes kidney function tests, most critically. You want the creatinine, the UN, EGFR. Then you want thyroid testing. See if they're hypothyroid to start. You need a CBC, urinalysis, EKG. If indicated, they have a history of cardiac disease. I don't think you routinely need an EKG in everybody if you don't suspect any problems. Pregnancy. If it's a person of childbearing potential or possibly pregnant, you may need a pregnancy test because you'll need to have extensive discussion of the pregnancy risks of lithium and any other drugs you're using. And then calcium and parathyroid and vitamin D levels. Now let's talk about dosage and titration of lithium. Lithium comes in capsules or white tablets. There are immediate release versions. They're called that, but they actually are not that immediate. They have 24-hour half-lives for the most rapid excreted form. Still, the half-life is 24 hours. And then there are longer-acting preparations with a half-life of longer than 24 hours. The immediate release, or IR, is preferred because once a day, immediate release lithium reduces urine volume and probably most other kidney side effects will be less. On anatomic examinations of kidney morphology that have been done in a number of cases, they compared biopsies with people on and off lithium in different forms, and the least damage to the kidney is associated with the patients who were getting the short-acting immediate release formulation once a day. So why is this important? Because you want to minimize the risk of long-term kidney problems. However, the immediate release should be given once a day. If you give it more than once a day, then you'll undermine some of its benefit and it may produce more tremor. When you give it once a day, they have most of their tremor at night. That period of lower lithium level compared to someone who's getting one of the longer-acting preparations, which keeps your level constant throughout the day and night, that's apparently more toxic to the kidneys than having an opportunity once a day to have the level drop below that level. And there seems to be no harm from the greater increase temporarily in the level from taking the drug all at once at night. What dose should you start? Usually, it would be 300 or 300 twice a day for outpatients, unless there's some drug interaction that you're anticipating. If they're on something that could raise lithium levels, like NSAIDs or antihypertensives, then you'd start lower. You might even start with 150, maybe in an elderly person, and work up gradually from there, checking levels. But for inpatients, where you're in more of a hurry, you have observation of the patient going on 24-7, you can usually start with 300 three times a day in divided doses. And then by the end of their stay in the hospital, you convert them over to once a day at night. But you would spread it out three times a day when first starting it just to minimize immediate side effects compared to starting 900 all at once for the first exposure to the drug. We usually check levels at the 12-hour period after the last dose, usually in five or six days, because as I mentioned, lithium has a half-life of 24 hours, so that means it takes five or six half-lives to reach steady state level, so you'll be able to see whether it's in the desired range of 0.4, 0 0.6 to 0.8. There is some change in dose when you shift from multiple times a day to all at night. The kidneys excrete lithium more slowly at night when you're sleeping. It reduces the total amount of lithium you have to give the patient to get the desired benefit. And it's about a 20% difference. So let's say they were taking maybe 150 milligrams, five tablets or capsules, and you're going to take it all at night now. 
you would give them four capsules at night. By the way, we prefer the capsules to the tablets because they're not very salty the way the pills are. That can induce nausea. It's an unpleasant sensation, that saltiness. And with the capsules, you avoid that. The next slide shows drugs that increase or decrease lithium levels that you need to take into account, whether they're on them now as you're starting the lithium or when you maybe see that these drugs are going to be started to your patient already on lithium and may require you to make adjustments to the dose. So drugs whose levels are increased when they're combined with lithium. The NSAIDs, the thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, angiotensin II receptor antagonists. Two examples would be lisinopril and enalapril. And then metronidazole, treatment for urinary tract infections, low-sodium diets, dehydration, and elderly people in general. Sulindac is an NSAID that is an exception to the rest of them. It seems not to change lithium levels. It used to go by the brand name Clinero. It is generic now. But anyway, I have a question mark because it's not 100% sure that it won't affect the levels, so you'd better check them. The following meds are not having any effect on lithium levels. The first is the diuretic amylaride, which is our preferred diuretic if you need to use one in a patient on lithium. It does not raise lithium levels, usually. You should still check the level of lithium after you've started a milleride to be sure it didn't change. Furosemide, aspirin, do not change lithium levels. Drugs that decrease lithium levels. Some of these we're really not using much today. Acetazolamide, mannitol, theophylline. Something you will very commonly encounter is those heavy caffeine users out there. The ones that are drinking 20 Pepsis a day, coffee, or stimulant drinks. So these will decrease lithium levels, sometimes by 50% or more. So you have to try to get situation stabilized with their caffeine use in relation to your lithium dose you're giving. But here's an important thing that decreases lithium levels, and it is mania. When people go into mania, there seems to be something different about how their sodium potassium ATPase, which is an enzyme that controls the in and out passage of lithium and sodium and potassium into cells. And it seems that when the mania starts, lithium will be drawn into the cells and will be present in a lower amount in plasma, with the result that lithium levels will seem to go down, will go down, in fact, when you measure them. But they're actually not down, probably. There's probably plenty of lithium in the cells and maybe even too much. So this situation leads to a common problem of people getting into lithium toxicity during treatment of mania because they're given too much lithium. The lithium levels are lower when you measure them than they actually are in the cells, and they get toxic. And then they're also coming down from their manias at the same time. So the lithium moves out of the cells back into the plasma, and super high lithium levels may now be present. So this causes major problems, causes the end of many lithium trials. People won't want to go back on it after that. So try to avoid that mistake. And another issue that comes up is pregnancy. That decreases lithium levels as well and causes issues with monitoring and titrating it. Doses and titration. For acute treatment of mania, you usually need 0.8 milliequivalents per liter briefly. Higher levels, anything over 0.8, may produce more flips into depression. This is not very well known, that you could be creating a higher risk of flipping into depression by using too high a dose of lithium to treat your mania. So you keep the level not much higher than 0.8. If you need to add other things, to bring them down, even temporarily, like with benzodiazepine, that would be preferable to going to super high lithium levels. And also, there's that risk of toxicity. 
the optimal maintenance level is 0.6 to 0.8 is okay, but you should not be going higher than that for maintenance. There's many problems associated with the higher levels. You can get more kidney problems over the long term. You can get toxicity, CNS toxicity, flipping into depression. However, lower levels are often adequate in older adults, like 0.4 to 0.6, and probably safer. It's important with lithium to avoid rapid discontinuations. This is associated with destabilization, early relapses, increased suicide. This is something you must remind and keep reminding over and over your patients to not do that. If they want to go off lithium, it should be tapered under your supervision slowly. Otherwise, they can rapidly decompensate. They may forget that you told them the first time. That's why you need frequent involvement so that you can remind them. Overdoses can be fatal. On the other hand, it's our best medication for people who are suicidal. So at least in the early phases of treatment where they still may be suicidal, you may need to give them small quantities. I will now summarize the key points of this video. First of all, baseline testing. Before or just after, if more convenient, sometimes you're really in a hurry to get that lithium started, but they haven't gotten their lab work yet. So get those tests, which include kidney function tests and thyroid function tests, most importantly, and maybe also calcium and PTH, parathyroid hormone. If there's concern about cardiac risk, an EKG may be done. If it's a woman who could become pregnant, consider the issues with this in the baseline evaluation. Second key point is about dosing. Dosing should almost always be with the immediate release formulation, not the long-acting. I prefer the capsule form of it, not the pills. And have you give it all at night. With an outpatient, you can build it up with all the doses at night, one at night, then two at night, then three at night. Dosing. Outpatients can start at 300 or 300 twice daily, or I prefer at least twice daily if you're going to start an outpatient, but then move it to all 600 at night in a week or so. But with an inpatient, you may want to start with three a day, and then you'll give three separate doses and transition them to all at night later. Inpatients, you can start at 300 three times a day, as I said. But do remember, when you make the switch from two or three times a day to all at night, lower the dose by about 20%. Watch for drug interactions with NSAIDs, antihypertensives, and others. Overly caffeinated patients may need higher doses to get where you need to get. And then for maintenance, 0.6 to 0.8 milliequivalents per liter. Kidney dysfunction is dose-related, so you want to stay in the middle of that range, or even slightly below it, if it's clinically effective. Higher doses will produce more flips to depression and other side effects.